Good morning, good morning, good morning. I know you can't see anything. I can't see anything. I'm sitting here. I can't see anything. That's because this is all on the inside. I'm sure I've got a thing somewhere for... Uh, it's underneath the chair next door. Aha! <laughs> that has been there for a year. There we go. That will do. That and the fact that I can put the windows down at the side so I can see either way. So, how are you? I'm doing very well. I am going to go the fast way. Sorry about all the blower noise and stuff like that. I'll uh, let me just use the Mark One wind, wind uh, review mirror uh, retracting device. It's a, like it's a nice early autumnal day, you know, it's, uh, there we are, everything's set up to defrost as far as possible. The reason why I haven't made a video for a while is because literally nothing's going on. Nothing is going on. You know that thing, may you live in interesting times. Well, I'm pleased to say that doesn't apply to me. I'm not living in interesting times. Everything is ticking away nicely. The staff are doing their job. I'm doing my job. You can see how much moisture there is in the air, can't you? Yeah, get over. It's funny, isn't it? The people who use these back roads, they all work on the basis that everyone else is going to get over. And let, you know, and, and everyone else will know how to get out of the way. And then when you get, um, you come across them, they don't move and they realise that you're not really going to move all that much. Then they get, whoa, I've got to get out of the way, you know. God knows what happens when two of them meet each other. And neither one of them gets out of the way. So, yeah, so what am I doing? What's going on? Right, well, I'll give you like a, I'll give you a brief synopsis, a brief overview of what's on my mind at the moment. In uh, world news, there's been a sort of a what's the best way to describe it? There's been a sort of a Warsaw ghetto uprising in the Gaza Strip, which the uh, Israelis are busy turning into the seat of Stalingrad. Oh, yeah, yeah. of course, this is the reason not to come down this road, isn't it? This is the reason. Notice the drains on the left that aren't working in the curb. Notice the curb that wasn't there five years ago. You know, it's my favourite disaster. A publicly funded disaster. Uh, yeah, what else? The, uh, we're in the middle of a election campaign in America. Well, it's all, it's all starting off really, you know. A lot of... Uh, Trump is, uh, having been written off pretty much, is now starting to come back into the running. The only question will be whether or not the uh, Democrats have mobilised enough of their supporters in the courts to lock him up. Although technically I think someone said he can still run for president even if he's in prison. So at which point he'll, he'll probably, probably pardon himself. Anyway. The, uh, Russia's uh, got, still got their oil embargo going on and uh, they can't get insurance for their ships unless they've sold oil below a certain price. So what they're doing is they're selling it basically to India and Pakistan who are quite happy to get discounted oil 
and who are then uh, selling it on to everyone else. And everyone's saying, no, oh, no, we're not buying oil from Russia. We're buying it from a refinery in uh, India where it's been remixed very slightly, you know. So, funny, isn't it? You know, best laid plans. Doesn't matter as a government what you try and do, you always, it never works out how you think it should or you'd like it to. Uh, I think you should really just give up. But let me put a wing around. See, the Americans, by weaponizing the dollar and uh, weaponizing the uh, international courts, now if Putin steps out of Russia, he's going to get arrested and extradited to the Hague. Well, uh, but basically push Russia and China further together. So, uh, uh, due to the, uh, you know, the fact that the American economy is not doing so brilliantly as it used to, but they did a thriving trade, sending Russia, uh, sending China bits of paper, and getting uh, Chinese goods in return. And now, the American debt's spiraling out of control. It's in a tailspin now. Russia and China have been uh, driven further together uh, to the point where uh, India, for example, wants to get paid for, for oil, which is basically Russian oil, and it wants to get paid for oil in uh, Chinese one because then Russia can buy stuff from China, take up the slack. So it's a lot of change, you know, fin de regime, as they say. But when empires collapse, all sorts of weird things happen. Weird stuff, weird, weird stuff. Stuff that you wouldn't think, you know, but it, uh, it just turns down a bit. So expect the unexpected, that's what it all boils down to. Bitcoin is uh, having a little bit of a rally. It's about $30,000 a coin. You're talking to someone who remembers when it's $200 a coin. So, you know, people say, oh, Bitcoin's down this week, isn't it? And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. People don't understand. Nobody who bought, who was in Bitcoin in the early days is ever going to be complaining about the price of Bitcoin. So, that's because they expect a lot of uh, institutional interest in Bitcoin, by institution I mean money funds, you know, big funds, family offices, uh, corporate investors, university, trust funds, stuff like that. They, they've seen Bitcoin been the best performing asset over the last sort of, well, at least 10 years or so, and they've not really had any exposure to it. It's, it's, um, it's amazing, really. I mean, you know, if your generation, if your generation Z or whatever comes after Z, then, uh, you know, and you're complaining that you can't buy a house or anything, then what I would do is I would say two things to you. I would say, you know, you're, you're like, you've got this mentality, oh, well, the boomers like me had it good, we had it all, we had it, you know, we were given it on a plate, we happened to live it through a time when money, there was money to be made and everything was cheap, etc., etc. And that, that is not actually the case at all. I mean, things started going wrong in 1971 when I was 12 years old. So don't, uh, for a minute, think that, uh, you know, probably my my mother's generation, they were sort of, they, they lived through the sound money era, the 1950s, that's when uh, the post-war recovery, that's when times were good. Relatively, I mean, obviously they were very poor compared to where we are now, but you know, compared to the pre-war generation, you know, they had a lot of things, didn't they? Refrigerators, irons, and my, not micro well, I mean, the late stage microwaves, you know. I mean, things like shower taps, you don't understand that most people who were brought up in the 60s and 70s didn't have a shower. We had a bath which had some rubber, a rubber spray that you had to push onto the uh, taps. So, you know, but that's, that was adequate, but that's all been lost, you know, the, the ability to live like that. I think uh, if you want to, uh, you, you know, 
amaze yourself really then go to a website called WTF happened in 1971 which is a funny uh, title for a website but oh that's an apple I've just picked all the last of the apples and uh, I don't really use them much my wife doesn't like apples and so I uh, won't touch them and so there's no point in me even buying a crumble mix and trying to get a crumble going so so uh, I picked them all and uh, they're all in the back there if I can show you probably not probably not I don't want to do anything that's dangerous So yeah, institutional money coming into Bitcoin, and uh, well, the reason why um, they couldn't have any exposure to Bitcoin is because, for the most part, the rules of their funds state that they can only invest in what they call blue chip stocks, which is uh, not you know they can't invest in uh, speculative real real estate or uh, anything that's not regulated, you know, anything that's not subject to the. Uh, uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission or you know what, what would be the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK or it used to be the Financial Services Authority they um, they're very strictly limited in what they can invest so really it's like shares in Apple shares in Google etc etc they're not allowed to just go go online and just buy a bunch of Bitcoin and then because then where, where would they custody you know there was nobody really that was available to do Bitcoin custody because you, you didn't want to you wouldn't want to store your own Bitcoin you know these are big players you know they might want they might want like 200 million pounds worth of Bitcoin dollars of Bitcoin and who you know which employee is going to be given the task of looking after that on their on their mobile phone <laughs> you know, forgetting the password etc etc so you have to have a Bitcoin custodian so that's where uh, People like Wences Cesaris, who was very early into Bitcoin, he, he uh, went out of the um, wallet business and went into the custodian business because it's a, you know it's a guaranteed income, isn't it? Mind you, the, the wallet business wasn't all that brilliant. The, the exchange businesses uh, make a lot of money, but uh, they've got a high failure rate, which people attribute to cryptocurrency but it's not really it's the exchange is certainly weak point they're always run by some fat American I won't say who um, you know who doesn't know what he's doing and just got this typical America America type mentality Yeah, so so now we've got custodians, and um, the uh, what what uh, these institutions are going to want is a share in an ETF, which is an exchange traded fund. So so for example, suppose I wanted some exposure to the price of gold, but I didn't want to buy a bar of gold because it would be difficult to buy and the spread would be too great when I sold it. In other words, I'd pay have to pay too much to trade it. And it's not very liquid. I mean, who, who around here is going to want to buy a bar of gold? So, not at the market rate anyway. They might want it half price, but not at the market rate. <coughs> so, what you do is you buy shares in a gold exchange traded fund ETF. And uh, what happens is you sort of put two thousand dollars in, and they buy an ounce of gold, and they look after it, and they charge you I don't know one percent, two percent a year or something. And at any time, their assets, the amount of gold that they've got in store is exactly equal to the value of the outstanding investments. So, uh, you know, if gold doubles, then your shares in your ETF double, um, which is great. And will work very well with Bitcoin because, uh, as I say, uh, if I was, you know, Harvard University's trust fund, investor investment panel then I want some exposure to something like Bitcoin you know probably five percent of the fund I reckon I would put in Bitcoin uh, because it's got a it's got a fantastic 
upside and, and really the worst you can do is lose all your money so which I know it sounds terrible you lose all your money but I mean let's say you invest five pounds that you can afford to lose and um, that's then there's a chance that you know within five years it might be worth 50 so I mean that's probably a, that's not a bad bet is it hello is that Honda gold wing like riding here with his blue t-shirt and shirt sleeves did look nice though didn't it 1800 cc there so yeah so <clears throat> but the problem is that the uh, american securities and exchange commission has uh, so far steadfastly refused to authorize any bitcoin exchange traded funds <coughs> based on the market price of bitcoin anyway they've they've um, authorized uh, futures futures trading on bitcoin through exchange traded funds which means which is basically two people betting on the future price of Bitcoin. But then these, those funds don't have to buy any Bitcoin, so they don't contribute to demand. And uh, as a result, um, it's just basically it's just too rich gets betting on betting on the price of Bitcoin next week, next month, whatever. And it's just a, it's just a game to them. It's just you know humans like betting, and so they can bet on that. Bet on chicken fighting, they can bet on raindrops down the window or the price of it. Um, but the uh, SEC says no actual, no actual uh, investment in Bitcoin itself. And uh, they've come into a bit of a problem with that because they've said that um, the reason why they won't allow what is called a spot Bitcoin ETF, in other words, one, the one that's based on the actual price of Bitcoin, the spot price of Bitcoin, is because um, there's market manipulation. A lot of people have pointed out it's a bit of a incongruous to say that uh, you can have a future and all of a sudden there's no market manipulation and everybody's happy with, with the market price of Bitcoin and yet as soon as you say I don't want to do an ETF, oh, all of a sudden it's manipulated and, 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 and not allowed, you know. So I think um, the pressure's mounting on them to say that there can be a spot ETF. And uh, as soon as they do say that, then all these institutions will come in. And sort of game theory sort of states that uh, uh, they'll need to come in early because if you, uh, you know, if, there, if there's an investment which is historically done extremely well, I mean hundreds of thousands of percent increase, and uh, it, it suddenly gets opened up to a much wider number of participants, then obviously the best gains are going to be early on. So you're going to want to be first in. A bit like an IPO or, or a denationalisation of, of something, you know, BT all over again. It can't be all over again. You're going to want to be in early. And so because you're going to want to be in early, <coughs> there's going to be a lot of early demand. And that uh, early demand becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The early demand pushes the price up, and then it's just a case of you hang on by your fingernails until you know your nose bleeds and you decide that you need to sell. Which for many people will be probably not not at all much. I mean, these are institutions; they're not day trading. You know, they buy stuff for endowments and stuff like that. They're hodlers. So the first the first one a hard deadline for the approval of the first Bitcoin spot ETF is 10th of January. And uh, the hard deadline for the bulk of the spot ETFs is the 15th of March. But the um, but the smart money is saying that the SEC is going to try and approve them all at the same time because they don't want to give any particular ETF an advantage, first mover advantage. And the reason why uh, they, you know, we know that that would be good for the for the ETF is because when the gold um, was able to be held in an ETF, 
the first ETF, the GLD ETF, became the dominant ETF. Now it's basically it's the only ETF. It's not technically it's not the only ETF, but I mean, you know, if you if you want a, a gold ETF, then the GLD ETF is pretty much the only, only game in town. Probably by virtue of uh, uh, economies of scale, you know, just reduction in fees because they hold so much and it's uh, so reputable now. So there you go. Now, obviously I'm going to qualify all this by saying this is not financial advice. <laughs> the new supply of Bitcoin is also going to halve next year, making it uh, so there'll be less less new supply on the market. And the, basically the supply is pretty exhausted anyway. I mean, there's only 21 million that are going to exist ever, and 19 million of those, or 19 and a half, are already in circulation. Uh, it's not like there's not much left now, so it's almost a perfect storm in terms of the price. But do your own due diligence, and I'm not charging you anything for this, so you know you can't touch me. This advice is all free, and it's not, you know, it's just for entertainment purposes only. This podcast. So sorry, there's no dentistry in it today, but and there might be something a little bit more, you know, worth your while.